The declaration of war in 1914 was greeted with hysteria. Many were convinced that it would finally unite Edwardian Britain. That it would transform ordinary young men into heroes. And that it would finally confirm Britain's unrivaled supremacy over the world. And one young artist was certain it would make him a star. Like Bomberg and Wyndham Lewis, Richard Nevinson had trained at the Slade. But unlike them, he had little natural talent, knocking out second-rate paintings that aped the avant-garde. Here he is, posing proudly in front of a painting he called Tum Tiddly Um Tum Pom Pom. The title says it all. But Nevinson's mediocre prospects would change one evening when he was lured to the theatre to witness an unorthodox performance by London's most infamous celebrity, a maverick Italian by the name of Filippo Tommaso Marinetti. Marinetti was a poser, an adrenaline junkie, and a veritable grand master of the silly idea. He had, for instance, proposed burning down all the world's museums, sinking the whole city of Venice, and he thought that nothing was more fun than a good old-fashioned car crash. But in this performance, Marinetti reached a new low. <laughs> Marinetti loved war, and he declared his love in an experimental sound poem that was supposed to give the public an authentic taste of the battlefield. The public's reaction was divided. Divided between disgust, horror, hatred, terror and outrage. But Nevinson was entranced. He too dreamed of battle, of glory, of heroism. And on a wave of patriotism, Nevinson enlisted. But he would be sorely disappointed. In 1914, he arrived in France, but was immediately deemed too weak to fight. So he spent his days as a medical orderly, pottering about on the lonely lanes of Flanders, far away from the front line. Though you wouldn't have thought it from his tales of daring do. Nevinson told one story that, in the middle of a Zeppelin raid, he got the wheels of his ambulance caught in a railway track as a train hurtled towards him and flames billowed around him, and he only escaped at the very last second. And on another occasion, the Germans apparently fired a shell directly at him, but it miraculously passed through a little hole in his ambulance and he emerged unhurt. And on another occasion, he was, for some reason, up in a hot air balloon, and an enemy aeroplane shot the air balloon down. The balloon was plummeting towards the ground, but once again, Nevinson escaped. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't believe a word of it. After just 10 uneventful weeks, Nevinson made his way quietly home. But back in Britain, he was greeted as a real war hero. So he busied himself making pictures that showed a hero's view of modern war. Pictures that would guarantee him public acclaim. And here, in the heart of the West End, Nevinson bagged his very own one-man show. Nevinson's exhibition was a sensation. 
Everyone who was anyone was there. Royalty, aristocracy, army generals, famous painters, famous writers, and no less than four past, present and future prime ministers. And when they were all assembled together inside the gallery, Nevinson made his entrance with a limp, a walking stick and in full army uniform. Nevinson reveled in his newfound glory. But the adulation was deserved. Though he'd never seen a moment of combat, he had managed to capture the essence of modern war. He'd discovered a formula. Art that was geometrical and modern, yet easy to understand. Art that could be appreciated by the connoisseur and layman alike. Here, a battalion march in unison up to the front line. Troops rest after the rigours of battle. And an aeroplane swoops down from the clouds. But the public's favourite painting was called La Mitrailleuse. Most viewers thought this was not just Nevinson's best work to date, it was the greatest painting of the whole conflict. Walter Sickert even called it the most authoritative utterance on war in the history of painting. Now, clearly, it's a powerful and uncompromising image of war, and not just any war. This is modern war. You can see a group of French machine gunners here. They're in a dugout. They're surrounded by barbed wire. One of them has been killed already. This one's panicking over the dead body, and these two are firing blindly into the distance. Now, this isn't a war of cavalry charges and heroism and flying flags. This is a war in which scared men fight clumsily for their lives and for no apparent reason. And that's what people admired about this picture. They admired it for telling them an inconvenient and unpleasant truth about what was happening across the channel. And they trusted it too, because Nevinson was a soldier. Nevinson had been there. And Nevinson had seen this firsthand in the trenches. But we know that wasn't true. Nevinson had never stepped foot inside a trench. And Nevinson actually painted this on his honeymoon. But the real truth about the war would come from a most unlikely place. This Buckinghamshire countryside was once home to a lonely young artist called Paul Nash, a man whose intense emotional bond with nature would make him the greatest war painter of the 20th century. On his long, solitary walks, Paul developed the fanciful idea that trees were like people, with personalities all of their own. And he painted them obsessively. But not even a sensitive young man like Nash could avoid the war. And eventually, he signed up. It was February 1917 when he disembarked at the port town of La Havre. He wondered what all the fuss was about. This was a subdued time in the war as armies regrouped and the generals argued over strategy. But after a few relaxed weeks, Nash finally received orders to move up to the front line. 
But during the lull, nature had reclaimed the battlefields, and the trenches were in bloom. Where his comrades saw death and destruction, Nash thought this place was actually quite nice. What wasn't there to like? There were trees, leaves, birds, sunrises. Even the trenches were quite pretty. In fact, the whole place reminded him of Sussex. And he couldn't resist the temptation to paint it. Two swallows swoop low past an orchard. And shrubs thrive amid the trenches. But this pastoral idyll wasn't to last. That spring, the British Army began preparing for a massive new offensive. And it was then that an accident would profoundly alter Nash's future. One day, Nash actually climbed out of the trench to make a sketch of some rather delightful lights he saw shining away in the distance. Anyway, as he stepped to the side to get a better look at them, he lost his balance, tumbled back into the trench and broke a rib. Now, he was immediately sent back to England to recover from the injury, but it was probably the luckiest thing that ever happened to him in his life. But only a few days later, his whole company was slaughtered in a disastrous offensive. Passchendaele, the most brutal and inhumane battle of the whole war. Hundreds of thousands of men disappeared into no man's land, and many of them never returned. After his recovery, Paul Nash returned to Passchendaele. But the place that he'd once found so beautiful was now a desolate wasteland. Nash was utterly horrified by what he saw here. And to understand how he felt, you really have to hear what he wrote in a letter to his wife after he saw it. Because I think it's one of the most powerful things ever written about the First World War, perhaps about any war. And this, this is what he wrote. Sunset and sunrise are blasphemous. They are mockeries to man. It is unspeakable, godless, hopeless. I am no longer an artist interested and curious. I am a messenger who will bring back word from the men who are fighting to those who want the war to go on forever. Feeble, inarticulate will be my message, but it will have a bitter truth, and may it burn their lousy souls. And it was that horror, that outrage, that desire to tell the truth about the war that caused Nash to make the greatest masterpieces of his career. <laughs> 